There you go. Right, afternoon everyone. Can everyone hear me? I'm going to stand in the mic. I'm going to wander around a bit. Um, I'd like to gauge the audience a bit, so can everyone put their hands up? Come on, don't shy. Come on. Everyone put their hands up. Right, keep your hands up if you are using BIM authoring tools. Right, that's telling. Um, and keep them up now still if you think you're doing BIM. Keep them up if your clients ask you to. That's good. And who's delivering COVID? Keep your hands up. And keep them up if you're enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, do you want to put your hand down? No, no, no. Right, that, that's, that's, that's my point. And the first point is that a lot of people are telling everyone they're doing BIM. A lot of people are telling people what they're using and what they're doing. But in actual fact, they're not going to get the best out of it if their clients aren't asking them to do it and paying them the right money at the right times to do it. Everyone is trying to force a BIM process and their BIM tools on the process that isn't in existence. And I've said this at many, many conferences, and there's a lot of people agree with that. So we need to get to the point where everyone's understanding and talking on the same basis. So a quick flick through this. If anyone went to BIM Show Live and came to one of my BIM Beginners Breakfast, sorry, this is exactly the same, but it'd just be much quicker. Um, this is what we're going to run through. I'm not going to read through them all because we'll, we'll get through them quite quickly. Um, but the aim of this session isn't to give anyone any answers about what they should do now. It's to make them think about how they should start their, their big journey. So this is what we're going to try and achieve in about 20 minutes. Um, all of that lot been before everyone, from small scale to big scale, from um, local to global, to from designers to end users. We're going to try and cover that, all of that now, but not in a detailed way, obviously. Um, first one up is why are we doing it? Um, this isn't necessarily applicable to every single person involved in BIM, but this has been a massive drive for the industry. The government mandated level two BIM by 2016, um, accompanied by a 20% reduction in costs. Are there, are there any clients in the room? Clients? Any people operating builders? No? Right, because that 20% reduction cost isn't through BIM, so let's just get that out the door first. Let's, that 20% reduction, from the government's point of view, is through their government construction strategy. BIM won't deliver you a 20% discount on its own. Um, but what we found during our work is that the private sector is getting there quicker. Um, we've got private clients, private multiple um, building estate owners who are able now just to say, we want you to use this piece of software, like the or or we'd like you to do this particular process to, in order for them to operate their buildings much better. So this is why, again, these two, two graphs are often used. Um, they're part of the BSI report. Um, they're not only applicable to the UK. They're, they're from the UK and the US. Um, but this is the cost of our industry. The dash line is our industry, the construction industry, getting more and more expensive since 1996 up until now. And our productivity is dipping. We're actually less efficient now, less productive than we were 100 years ago. Uh, sorry, since uh, 1964. So we, we're getting less efficient compared to other industries. So the manufacturing industries, they're all taking automation and technology and using that to be more productive. The construction industry isn't doing that. So we're, that's years of under-delivering in two massive ways to our clients, so we need to change that. Building life cycle costs, I'm sure Ed will mention a little bit more about this later, but these are life cycle costs, 2% are in the design fees of the building, 34% in construction and 64% in the operation. So we can start to un understand and appreciate from a client's perspective and try and convince them that a small extra fee and uplift in our design fee from an architect's point of view will actually give massive benefits, could actually give massive benefits during operation. Um, Arab Associates, if no one knows what we do, we're a multidisciplinary practice. We only take projects if we do architecture structures and MEP, plus we can call on the rest of Arab to do any other specialist engineering. Um, so we technically are in a, probably the best position we can be, working under one fee, one program, one design brief to deliver a building. Um, we'll try and make the most of, of this BIM process by doing that. It's nothing new. Um, we see BIM as an evolution of digital design. We've been doing that for years. Brief timeline, a few project examples, we'll just whip through these, you can download these later, of all the things we've been doing over the years. Um, this is where we think we are um, as a company, but also um, it's widely acknowledged that the UK is about here in, in terms of adopting new technologies, in terms of getting through that perceived idea of what the technology and what the process could do to us and for the industry, and we go, oh, well, it might do this, this, and this, and then realising it actually doesn't do that and then actually dealing with how we're trying to get it to do what everyone thought it might do. So that's where it's widely acknowledged that the UK is. We're on this slope of enlightenment. It may not be everyone, but it's, it's the people at the forefront of it getting to that point where we're trying to make it do what everyone thought it did in the first place. BIM acronyms, if anyone's new to BIM, um, you'll probably have read a lot of these somewhere. I'm not going to explain what they all mean, but it, 
what we try to say is just use sensible English. Use the words that these acronyms stand for. It makes a lot of sense. Don't be bewildered by it. There's too many of them to go through. Busting a few BIM myths. Um, David Miller Architects, London-based practice, very good practice, um, produced a report probably about three years ago now that said this is where we are on our BIM journey. They're a practice of eight people, they're now a practice of 16, and th their report basically said, it was published in the MBS BIM survey, that they had spent up to £10,000 per workstation per person to get their staff up to the level they're at. My point is that a lot of smaller practices, a lot of uh, plumbers, joiners, brickies, are all seeing this and going, I don't have £10,000 to spend in doing BIM. It's not applicable to everybody. This is specific to a small architectural practice wanting to grow, wanting to improve the work they were doing. So that's the first myth we're trying to bust. Second one, it's not just a 3D model. I'm sure everyone can appreciate it. It's about the data and about the information, about the, the information flowing right the way through the process, not just throwing it over the fence and letting people deal with it afterwards. Myth number three, a lot of people think it means more work and it takes longer. My experience is that doesn't. I appreciate that's from an architect's um, point of view rather than structural MEP, builders, contractors, clients. But if it's not working for you, you should make it work because there must be something wrong in my opinion. Myth number four, the Autodesk sales machine has convinced everyone that Revit equals BIM. Doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, I've start, I started my job at Arab Associates in November. Um, the first thing I did is tell people that I wasn't going to make them use Revit. It is our chosen production tool. But if people are happy using Grasshopper and Rhino and, and SketchUp and whatever they happen to be using, I'm not going to force them to throw that away and use something different. But there are other tools out there, and we, we concentrate now on using the right tool for the right job. Pitfalls, Hollywood BIM. We've all seen them, nice glossy images, videos, timelining things that look like the building's being building, but often aren't connected to any construction program whatsoever. It's, it's just Hollywood BIM. It's, it's making things shiny, making things look good that aren't necessarily the truth. Overselling your own capabilities. This is probably quite a big one right now. Everyone's saying they can do it. If you can't do it, you will be found out. If you're not found out during the process of trying to win that job, when it comes to delivering, you'll be found out very quickly if all of the other members of the team are actually able to produce the right information. Overmodeling, and again, this is technology specific, but if you've started to take um, a process and you've, your team isn't au okay fait with how you should deliver information, they will model doorknobs and letterboxes at concept stage. You need to control things, make sure people are delivering the right information, have the emphasis on the information that's, that's required at that stage. And don't ignore the challenge. There is a challenge out there. The government said we need you to be able to do this by 2016. There's no point in waiting until 2016 to, to say, right, OK, we need to, need to now have a look at it. There are things you can do now. That you might find that you're already doing some of it, but you need to make sure that you're in a position that when these jobs come around, that you're able to take them. And as I've already said, the private sector is getting there much quicker. So, benefits to the projects. I'm going to whiz through these very, very quickly. Um, but this is a diagram that shows the, the work process through from briefing, through concept design, documentation, construction, all the way around through to demolition, possibly refurbishment. Um, and taking that information back into the, the briefing process that you've learned through that, that entire process, back into the beginning of the next book. Um, what we're used to doing in the old fashioned way of working is having all these walls between each stage. You work to a stage and you stop, and then the information drops, and then someone else starts and continues. So you get to the point where it's very staccato. You get information that builds and falls and builds and falls. So all we're trying to do is remove those walls and ensure that the data goes right the way around the process. There is useful data all the way through. Um, again, each one of these slides, uh, coming up in a second, has a list on the bottom right-hand side um, that shows possible benefits from each one of these stages. I haven't got time to run through all of those now. Um, but we're talking about briefing, how you brief is very important. It's about educating our clients to ensure that they are briefing the design team, the contractors, their supply chains to ensure that they can provide, or that they can get what they want it out of it at the other end. And it's not about words and fancy words saying, oh, what would like it to be this, like to be that. If they pr provide us with a brief that we can use in a digital world to test the building against, it might be a spreadsheet, it might be a series of numbers or letters, but it enables us to use technology to test against and say, right, okay, that does match the brief, it does pass, but it looks like this, or it looks like this, and there's different ways to do things. Design analysis documentation, there's a, there's a lot of this all covered already. I think that one of the early adopters were, were, were the architects and engineers, so we've, we've been through the process of, of learning how we can use new tools, and we've been through it for, for years and years beforehand. But the importance now is to get that information and push it through in a format that, that guys can use it for prefabrication. And we can take that prefab information and, and apply that to the construction program, so that we have more surety of, of the data that we're using and more accuracy. And again, 
we'll hear a little bit later on about the operation and maintenance side of things. We need to ensure that what we're providing is actually useful. We've had years and years of providing big sacks of paper in boxes for people to use. Um, we need to just free that information up, allow it to be accessible, allow some of it to be live information, some of it to be recorded information that's sent from the items of plant equipment through to the model and have alerts show up when they need to. And then again, using that information through um, back into refurbishment or the next group of projects we said earlier. But also demolition. There's a massive amount of information we have if we have a model, a geometric model of a building, to know exactly how many trucks we're going to need to demolish a building, exactly what material can be reused and where the potential issues may be with disposing of materials. Benefits to the company. More control and greater QA. If anyone's used any BIM tools than BIM QA, altering tools, they will know it's a, it's a much easier process. There's a much easier way to, it's a different way, I'll admit, but it's an easier way to guarantee your building's QA. Easier access to information. People have iPhones, smartphones, iPads, you can get to information now. And that's the important thing, is being able to get to the information, no matter what that information is. Fewer resources or more work undertaken. This is a point I made um, in my original company when I spoke to my directors and said, this piece of software is quicker. We don't have four people drawing plans, sections, elevations, and, and a 3D model. We have one person doing that and another person curating what they were doing. So we've, we've effectively halved some of our teams. So you can either, time's hard, get rid of those people, they can move on, or you can take on more work. And that, that's the truth of the matter. Again, specifically from an architectural point of view, I know there are slight issues with MEP guys. Opportunities open to larger projects. You've got this ability to create more work, better work, better QA work. That opens up larger clients. You can, you can approach these clients and say, yeah, we can confidently deliver you a, a hotel. David Miller's a good example. They, they've gone from workings to um, small residential extensions to hotels, schools, and other large buildings. And again, just reiterating the point, don't wait until 2016 and find out that you've missed out on the opportunities. And also, don't assume that everything you hear is true. I mentioned this earlier on, there's a lot of showboating going on, a lot of bin wash, and a lot of people saying they can do certain things that they can't do. <coughs> Just make sure your own company is able to do what they're being asked to do. And again, this is the common saying, don't presume you can buy BIM in a box. It's just not about the software. So, BIM tools, briefly. First one, most important one, pen. And I've said this before so many times, that when I try to say to people, this is what we need to do, we need to use the BIM process, we need to use this tool, this tool, this tool. People said, are oh, you going to stop me sketching? No, that's not what we're going to do. That is a, such a brilliant tool. You can sit there with a client with a piece of paper and go, this, this idea. And they say, well, no, how about something that does this and this? And you go, oh, no, there's another idea. You don't have to say, let me take that away. Two days later, come back and say, is that what you meant? You don't need to do that. It's a pen. It's very good to use. People just misunderstand that. A telephone. Collaboration. BIM equals collaboration. That doesn't. It doesn't happen on its own. You have to speak to people. People assume that because you change something in a model that everyone knows about it. So we need to ensure that you're actually talking to people. It doesn't happen like that. And that's the other side of talking to people. You need to listen to people. Listen to your internal teams, listen to your wider design team, and listen to what the industry is doing. But as I said, be careful. If not all of it's true. So now onto some of the proper BIM tools that you've heard of already. Um, again, we're going to go through them all, but there's a, there's a list of tools there for each, each different stage, just the ones that I could think of and jot down at the time. Um, some of them will be applicable to you, some of them won't be but there will be people who need to use these tools that you'll be working with, and you need to make sure, as we keep saying, that the information flows from one tool to another. It doesn't always work. Another thing that people tend to do when adopting a BIM process is to just throw technology at it. It doesn't always work. There's a quote from Bill Gates from several years back. If, you, if your process, if your company is inefficient, all the technology will do is magnify those inefficiencies. If you get back to the point where you can ignore the technology and go through the process and you think, actually, my company works quite well right now, then the technology will make that better. So if things don't work within your company right now, take a look at those first before you even think about adopting BIM. And the training side of things. There will always be certain levels of training. You may, you may be the person in charge of training. You, you may be the person that needs to be trained. But you will be at one of these three levels. You'll be the technical person, the, the skill set on, on the side, in the office, doing stuff or you'll be someone thinking about it strategically, thinking, I wonder what that process and those tools can do for me. And there's a different, different balance as to what you'll need. You either need a knowledge of, of how it works and, and how the process works, or you need a skill to be able to do that process. And it's just acknowledging the fact that you'll need those different types of people, and the people in the middle you tend to hold things together because they know quite a bit about that. The cleaning curve, bingo slide. Where's Stephen Hammond when you need it? 
you'll see this in every BIM presentation you go to. It's, a, it's an idealised situation of what we should do in order to make the most of the construction and design process. We're looking to, using uh, the BIM process, bring forward the effort curve to a point where we can maximise any design decisions and get the most value out of them. The further along we put the efforts into the, the discussion, into the design, we start to cost money. We're making late changes, we, we're going to cost money. If we bring that right forward to the point where we're not even on site yet, we're testing these things, we can make those informed choices. And the industry is becoming more sophisticated. We've now got the new plan of law work launched last week, um, which is in line with, or which has aligned three major disciplines. So the CIC work stage and our numbers are other letters. And we're all delivering the right information at the right time. So we're not all out of sync. So we're not paid a certain amount of money to deliver different information. So hopefully this will align things a little bit better. And the CIC suite of documents um, that were issued probably a month and a half back. Um, again, documents that have taken a, quite a while to write, but it enables people that are new to BIM now to, to pick up these and go, actually, legally I'm fine. My PI is covered. I know where I'm working. I know what the process is now. And I know what roles, what, what my role is in this process. What, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And this has taken us four or five years to get to. So the early adopters have got to the point where we've, we've struggled through this and going, well, I'm giving my model to people. What does that mean to be legally? What are these people going to be using it for? Does that leave me open to, to being seen? And these set out the facts and say, actually, everything's all right for level two. And we've got PASS 1192 that sits alongside those. And as a suite of documents, that's, that's pretty much got everyone's mind settled now. So everyone can just work in a normal fashion. Read them. They're free. All of them are free to download. Um, the RBA website's there um, live as of last week. Deliverables. This is another point of contention with uh, my directors is they think we're doing more work. We're doing different work. We're giving people more information. We're not. It's the same information we've always given them. There's nothing different there. But it's a slightly different format, that's all it is. So we're asking to now deliver the native model, so whether that's Revit, Rhino, AutoCAD, whatever it happens to be, MicroStation, we're giving them a live version of the model which they can then use. We're giving them a read-only version of that so we can audit track that, we can say this is actually what it was and you can mess around with that version. So we've always got a record of what we issued and when. DWFs and PDFs, 2D deliverables are still our backup legally. So if there's a difference, there shouldn't be a difference between the model and the 2Ds, 2Ds take precedent. And a Kobe spreadsheet, which everyone hates. Uh, that's what a Kobe spreadsheet looks like, if no one's seen it before. Um, and I tried to blow it up and make it more clear, but it didn't work, because it's still horrible. It's just bigger. Um, that's, that should be the holy grail of what this information is. It's just a pain in the butt to complete, and it should be applicable to every single person on the process. So people should be able to say, right, I want to take this information from it at this stage. I want to take this information from it. But we currently have a big issue in, in terms of creating that. It, it does take a little while longer for us to do that. So what next? Start now. We've said already that people need to stop delaying and waiting for 2016 to roll around and then suddenly realise that there are people just leapfrogging you and being able to take work from you when they shouldn't be. Think about the eye and BIM and think about how the information moves around your particular company. And that's probably the most important piece of advice from today is that each company uses information in a different way. You've got to know how that information flows throughout the company. Make it efficient and ensure that whatever technology you apply over the top of that enables you to work with other people. And then seek out as many events as possible. Prime example, this one today is free. I'm surprised that there's empty seats, but you get last minute cancellations. Um, go and see them. There are some that are paid. There are some that are just purely from manufacturers and software guys who just want to sell you stuff. It might be right for you at the time, but make the most of them. And check out what technology you need and who can offer it. So leave that decision to last. Just be aware of what's available, but leave that decision till the very last minute when you know what you need to do as a company. There you go. There's another source of information, Twitter. Um, get on there. If you do BIM, there is an active Twitter community. The government have acknowledged um, the UK BIM crew as, a, as the latest source of information for BIM-related stuff. If you, are, if you have a question and you want an answer, you can use that hashtag UK BIM group or Global BIM group and you'll get an answer fairly soon, um, within about 30 minutes on Saturday. This is quite impressive. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Casey. Uh, if there are any immediate questions for Casey, then please feel free to shout or you can leave the questions till the end. Okay. Uh, next we have...